Hello, everybody. Let's get started. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Lunder Conservation Center program today. I'm Kate Maynard, the paper conservator for the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And I know we are all looking forward to today's talk by Rick Johnson and Paul Messier about their very innovative collaboration. Their lecture is entitled, Breaking New Ground, Computational Tools for Art. And I want to add a special thank you to Abigail Chaudhry, our former program uh, coordinator who actually arranged this program. So before I introduce our speakers, I ask that you silence your cell phones. And I also want to mention that we'll have a question and answer session after the two speakers have finished. And we have two staff who will pass along microphones on either side of the room. And because we are recording this program today, we ask that you do use a microphone so that we can hear you and all of our audiences will be able to hear you now and in the future. So Rick Johnson will be our first speaker. C. Richard Johnson, Jr. received the first PhD minor in art history granted by Stanford University, along with a PhD in electrical engineering in 1977. Forty years later, he holds the list of impressive affiliations that you see up here on the screen. Professor Johnson has founded four projects with cooperating research teams pursuing the same goal, matching manufactured patterns in art supports, canvas thread count automation in 2007, historic photographic paper classification in 2010, laid paper chain line pattern marking and matching in 2012, and watermark identification in Rembrandt's etchings according to Hinterding's taxonomy in 2015. An overview of these pioneering projects in computational art history will be the subject of Professor Johnson's talk today. Our second speaker, Paul Messier, is the founder and Pritzker director of the Lens Media Lab at Yale's Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage. Established in 2015, the focus of the LML is the creation, dissemination, and interpretation of large data sets derived from museum and reference collections of artist materials. Notable among these is the LML's collection of historic photographic papers, which is the largest of its kind in the world, and which was assembled by Paul over the course of decades. As the founder of three private companies dedicated to cultural heritage preservation, Paul has published widely, holds two patents covering innovative techniques for the characterization of materials, served elected terms to the board of directors of the American Institute for Conservation, and recently completed a multi-year Mellon-funded initiative to establish a Department of Photograph Conservation at the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. So please help me welcome Rick, who will be our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me start by thanking the Smithsonian for giving us this opportunity to describe what we think is a new and uh, rapidly growing field where you apply computation to try and solve problems in art history and conservation. Um, so um, as soon as I figure out. So what I'm going to do is talk to you about the four projects that were mentioned in my intro. And uh, you'll, the, the, you'll be able to read these better when I blow them up at each slide. But what I want to tell you is that first, it's kind of the pattern of what we're going to do. So. Um, I started with thread counting with the Van Gogh Museum and then worked on photo paper with MoMA and that's when I met Paul. So he uh, was a, already at that point an expert in uh, photo paper uh, conservation, identification, etc. So you'll notice in our talks that we have one slide that's the same. And so there'll be a quiz later if you can remember which one it is. Uh, you, you get to leave without paying a fee. Is that that's a, is that right? Okay. So, uh, so anyway, the but my, my objective is to begin to start these, get both sides interested, and draw a bunch of engineers in, as well as convince people from the art side that what the engineers and computer scientists have to offer is useful. And then after it's bubbling, after the, the, you know, the 
stew starts cooking, say, I'm out of here, have fun, enjoy, and I'm going to go do another one. So, uh, so I also, as we said, I'll work on, and, and by the way, engineers love acronyms, so TCAP and so on and so forth. But the one I'm working on now mostly is uh, watermark identification. So I'm going to just tell you a little bit about each of these. And of course, the very first one has the most that's associated with it, so I'll spend more time on that one than the others. So there, you can see it a little bit better. So I have this yellow that tells you about the project, who I started it with, or which museum I started it with. Then the thing below it is the math tool that was used. So I don't know how many people are here have mathematical backgrounds, but don't worry, there won't be any equations. But the idea is that in each case, I'm using techniques that are typically known to undergraduate engineers. So I'm trying to find projects where we can actually have a research experience for undergrads. And the field is new enough that if I look long enough, I can find several of these types of problems. Then I'm going to tell you what we used it for. So that's this uh, role mate hunting, whatever that means. Uh, I saw goodwill hunting, and so that gave me the title, right? But role mate hunting means we're trying to find two canvases that originally were on the same role. And that kind of, if you will, proximity, if you know other things about the artist, can help you with dating and authentication, et cetera. And then this has blossomed into something that actually is an open problem for which there's no answers right now. And we'll try to apply some of these techniques and are beginning to apply them to Chinese silk paintings. So I'm going to start with, a, with the basic problems the museum posed for me, and then later it'll advance into something different. So how many people have counted threads before? There must be some conservators here, right? There's a few. What does that mean? Well, that means that uh, basically the idea is that if you have two canvases that came from the same roll, their thread count should be very similar. Everybody knows what a thread count is. It's the way you buy pillowcases. You know, it's how many threads per centimeter or inch as you move across the fabric. And the denser the fabric, typically the finer it is. We, for canvases that are used by artists uh, in the 17th century, I'm going to be looking primarily here at Vermeer, t the thread counts tended to be in the teens, so somewhere between 12 and the low 20s. <clears throat> and what you typically have is in, you have in the museum x-rays of the paintings, and the x-rays are primarily to see things underneath the paint surface that you can't see with your eye. So for instance, it's very interesting to the art historian and the conservator to know how the underlayers were done, but for the art historian to know maybe how the artist changed the composition before getting to the final version, which you see on the surface. So the x-ray allows you to see, uh, or it, the x-ray is attenuated by r materials that absorb our radiographic materials, so uh, like lead white, so the lead in it, and the different absorption allows you to see the different paints. So you can sort of make out in this x-ray, some of the features of this same painting by Vermeer, very famous, The Art of Painting at the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. This is an x-ray of a small excerpt right about her shoulder. And there's a green thing on here. But you can see it the, our, our, in, right in the middle of the painting here. And this, I don't know about you, but I find this hard to visualize. So what we can do is invert the, scale, invert the grayscale. And now it looks like a piece of carpet or something. And so you can imagine being able, after you've put on the magnifying glass, you have an x-ray that's a film, put on a light box, you put on a magnifying glass, and you step up to this and you start counting. One, two, three, four, that's the vertical threads. How many people want to sign up to do this eight hours a day? <laughs> well, that's the problem. So what happens is, is that the, the conservators need to do this. They look at a couple of thread counts, and if one of them is, has 12 threads per centimeter and the other one has 15, they probably aren't from the same roll. In fact, they can't be from the same roll. So, however, if they're both 12, it doesn't mean anything. It just means it's possible for they're from the same roll. So this is one of those things that gives you a negative result instead of a positive result. But this is something they would like to be able to do, and it's so tedious that you would like to be able to do it with a computer, which never sleeps, doesn't take coffee breaks, doesn't go to the bathroom, doesn't need to eat, this kind of stuff. So that's what we were asked to do. Well, it turns out that uh, this light and dark is a, something that's, if you think about it as a signal that goes light and dark and light and dark, it's like a fluctuating or periodic signal. And that's the same way when you go to the doctor's office now, they put a little thing on the end of your finger and to take count your pulse. That's done with an infrared beam that goes through the skin, and it sees this signal, and then signal processing is applied. They get your pulse. 
So it's a problem that's already been solved in a different domain. In fact, there's hundreds and hundreds of algorithms for trying to find the frequency of periodic signals. Exactly what I was looking for. This only took a year and a half of visiting the Van Gogh Museum every couple of months until we finally stumbled across this problem and I thought, oh, I can do this one. And so we actually developed an algorithm and, now, and then it took us four years because most museums when I started this 10 years ago weren't very comfortable with letting you have their scientific images. That's, that's changing. There's a lot of that going on the web now. And so we were able to count the average thread count of all 34 of his paintings on canvas. See, I just went through three slides really fast, right? So, so what? Well, you can see there's a lot of numbers here, but this is the problem with tables of numbers. Unless you're used to looking at them, it's not that uh, helpful. So what we're going to do is put them in what's called a scatter plot. So the 34, there's 36 is the number here because there's two of his that are on panel. And these numbers are chosen from Walter Lietke's catalog of Vermeer paintings. These are the numbers he gives them. And you can imagine that, wow, these look really close. Maybe they're the same canvas. Okay, so, but you can't tell. Now you can tell that this one and this one won't be the same because they're too far apart. So this was all they asked us to do, but how did we do this? Well, we actually counted in every half centimeter square across the entire surface of the painting. So for a normal size painting, this would be like 4,000 counts, which if you did it by hand would probably take you weeks to, because you know, the tedium would set in. So, but once we have them all everywhere across the canvas, instead of giving you a table of numbers or the average, what we're going to do is try to give you an image. And this is one of the things where we're communicating with people that are visual art studies. I mean, they're visual, they're, they're the, the, if you will, the visual acuity of conservators and art historians is much more advanced than that of engineers. So the idea is to try and put this information into something that art historians and such could immediately appreciate. And the idea was is to represent each square where we counted the th threads with a color. And we end up with something that looks like this. Do you notice anything particular about this image? This is the vertical threads. And what you notice is that if you go along a column here, the color tends to stay the same. This is the color scale for these. So what you're seeing are stripes. And the stripes, if you think about it for a few minutes, are due to the way that the weaving is done. So how many people have done any weaving? One, two, okay, a handful. You explain to the people that are sitting next to you, okay? So when you set up the loom, you pull the threads from one spool to the other through the weaving machine, and they tend to stay close together because they're under tension, that little group, all the way through the entire canvas, which could be 20 meters, 50 meters. So the thing is, is if you move over a little bit, that group of threads also stays the same all the way through, but they might be a little bit different in how many there are per centimeter, okay? You can't see it typically. It's very hard to tell just by looking at the canvas. But the computer does all this calculation, immediately you see these stripes. What if I cut the image in half here? So what if this had been two paintings? This is actually a pretty sizable painting for, Van Gogh, for Vermeer. Well, then I would be able to show that the two were the same by moving them back and forth and lining up the stripes. With me? You're supposed to go. <laughs> okay? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Sorry? Yes. Oh, great. Okay, so now what we're going to do, now that we have this idea, we're going to, since we've got the x-rays of all 34, let's play the game. Let's make maps of all of them and see which ones match. Why would we do that? Well, if you know that two were made at the same time and you're trying to, if you think the artist actually goes through canvas and then buys some more, then what you've just told yourself is you can tell these two were painted about the same time if they have the same, same weave mat pattern. Furthermore, if you have one that you don't think is by Vermeer and another one that you know is by Vermeer and they match up, then the one that you, is a maybe becomes much more positive. So we're providing material or scientific evidence that helps in dating, authentication, and as I'll point out in a minute, even artist intent. So, okay, let's start doing this. So here's the most interesting one. This is three, three pairs. So, if, you know, now 
As engineers, we just say, hey, look, don't these look like they match? You decide you're the art historian, you're the expert, but you can see all the features in this vertical one here. They match these two. That's the two paintings over there, configured the same way. You can see the canvas is turned before he painted on it. Then these two here in the middle match horizontally. And then these two here match vertically again. So the question is, if he bought this piece of canvas, where's this one? Where's that one? Okay, but this most interesting thing is, is that uh, when I first started this, one of the experts, uh, he'll remain nameless, but he's the head of collections at the Rijks Museum. So this is a great project, but you're not going to find any matches. I mean, there's 150,000 or more paintings done in the 17th century in the Netherlands, and this guy only painted 34 that we have now. What's the chance that any of them are going to match? Here we have three pairs that fit together. This is, so what's happening? Oh, here's another thing. Look at the dates. The biggest problem with Vermeer dating is that there's, we have no documented evidence, no provenance for the dates. So they're done stylistically, and what I've done here is I've collected the dates from four of the major catalogs, and this is the range of dates. So they're pretty uncertain about when these were done, but these three all look like they were done at about the same time. What's he doing? Is he storing the last piece of canvas for eight years somewhere in his studio? We don't have any idea. Or is that one dated wrong? Don't know. Here's two more. Um, trying, the, you can use different color schemes to find the stripes. And it also, it's kind of, you kind of have to imagine that they match to some degree. But what you're looking for are the bold and big changes, and you want to make sure these all match up. But look at these two paintings. The conserv the, these are the astronomer and geographer. The, the model looks the same. The dates are pretty close, according to most of the experts. And so these two are thought of as what's called a pendant pair. So they were meant to be, mount could be mounted together. Often this was done in the 17th century for a pair of portraits. If you go to the National Gallery, they have a handful of these, where they have both members of a couple, husband and wife. And uh, this meant that the artist typically bought the canvas in one go in order to do this, uh, this project. Though there's still some debate among the art historians, the person that I worked with most closely at this time, Walter Lietke, in his catalog, believed that these were meant to be a pendant pair, which tells you something about the intention of the artist. Here's another one. Do you think those match? This is another supposed pendant pair. Well, one is the... Uh, Lady, woman standing at the virginals. The virginals is this kind of harpsichord piano instrument. And seated, uh, Walter thinks they're a pendant pair. Uh, he thinks one of them's the good girl and one of them's the bad girl. And that's, uh, so this Dutch paintings often had moral lessons. So if you look at it, the one at the top, if you can see this painting in the back that's upside down, that's a Cupid. If you look at the painting here, which you can barely see, I'm assuming, but this is actually a painting known by another artist from the 17th century, and it's a brothel scene. So I think right away you can get the idea as to which one's the good girl and which one's the bad girl. You can read his paper. There's a lot more to say. And this is the one that actually got us started. This one's a little harder to see that it matches, but you can see many of the details are matching. This is the only privately owned Vermeer uh, that's considered a true Vermeer. Uh, and a lot of people hate it because they think the yellow shawl looks ugly. And in fact, now we know that that's an overpainting of uh, Vermeer's painting. And the most experts, many of the top experts, accept it. Now the one on the right is a lace maker in Paris, and it's undoubted as a Vermeer. This was one of our first matches, which convinced other people in the field to give us their x-rays. OK, so that's six pairs that I've showed you so far. Remember, there weren't supposed to be any. Okay, so you can see the three boxes up at the top. Those are, that's the group of four, and here's the others. And notice, these are a little bit far apart. So what about all these in here that are really close together? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at painting 13. And what we noticed on all of those six pairs is that the thread count in both directions was in, within one thread per centimeter between the two paintings. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into, say, pick a painting. So now we're developing a strategy. Or if you think as an I think as a engineer, we're developing an algorithm for finding matches. So we're going to look at all the ones that are within one thread per centimeter in both directions, the smaller and larger thread count, and we get nine that might be possible. Okay, so how, how do we deal with that? 
So we're going to take the thread, the weave map for the one that we're interested in. This is the horizontal thread count on the top for L13. And then we're going to look at the lowest number one that is similar. And the idea is to take this image here and move it down next to this one and just run it up and down and maybe even turn it over and maybe put it on this side and visually see if they match. What we're doing now is we're bringing the human back into the loop of the decision of what's going on. Whether it's not trying to let the computer make all the choices. We're letting the, the human that's the expert come back in and use their expert knowledge about these things in addition to their visual acuity. And I think you can see right away that, of course, it doesn't match this one over here, which was the vertical count for L7. But the canvas could have been rotated 90 degrees. Remember the first match we had, had some this way and some this way. <clears throat> so there's no match here. Uh, this is the vertical count for the one that we're interested in. First, the first choice for L7, those don't match either. How many of these we got to go? We got eight, forget it, I'm not gonna do all the slides. Let's just jump to a group of them all. So here's the four possibilities. So at the top, you have the, the, the one on the left and the one on the right in the top row are the horizontal and vertical thread counts for the painting of interest. And then you'll have on the next row, the horizontal comparison to the horizontal thread count of the horizontal and the vertical of the L7. And then the other two of those, that first, those first two rows are what we just looked at. Then the paintings below that are all the other possible tight count matches within one thread per centimeter in both directions. And if you start looking at these, you'll ultimately find the one that has the X in it actually matches the one up there. So let me show you that match. So it could either match on the left or on the right. That's the problem. If they match with these, it does, you don't know which way they're supposed to go. You also don't know if it might need to be rotated or it might need to be flipped. So if you flip it, you get this nice looking match. Does everybody, what do you think? Does that look like a match? Just found this last month, by the way. So you're the first people to hear about it. Uh, why does this matter? Well, the one on the top is from the Frick collection, and it's the one they have the least provenance upon, whereas the one on the right is considered an undoubted Vermeer. So this gives them some sense, that, uh, some more evidence that they actually do have a Vermeer. Here's another one, L17. Also, you'll see the painting in a minute. And here we did the same thing, match, 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 look, move them around, flip them, turn them. Then it takes a while because the one here is the last one that matches it. So uh, it looks like this. Uh, this one is in, the one on the left in the, in the Met, the one on the right in the Rijks Museum. Now, what you'll also notice is that these also, in many cases, the dates were appearing across the bottom. The dates aren't the same. Well, we don't have any documented evidence about his studio practice. We do know that he didn't have any students. So now the question is, should we rethink the dating? And the, and the experts I'm talking to are starting to think that this maybe should, you should be trying to reconsider the dating and not be perfectly stylistic. The, typically, the typical stylistic sense is that the, the artist has a single arc of development across their career. And therefore, what, but the other theory is, is that the artist painted a couple of things that somebody five years later really liked and said, could I have one of those? And then you go back and paint one in that style. If you do that, then you know, this idea of dating them stylistically starts to not necessarily be the way to do it. So it's raising questions that are very basic about the dating and authentication. And it turns out that we are just about to I can't help but give a little plug, so we're just finishing a book that'll be produced this fall on these canvases, and I have, uh, it's a collection, you can read all the titles. Arthur Wheelock and Walter Leica are probably the two top Vermeer experts in the world, and uh, Arthur wrote the intro. Uh, and uh, what we do in the middle of this book is we also provide you with all the computer algorithms, so when you go read this book, you'll be able to snag all the software, uh, and it's run in a free, uh, free reader from Mathematica, and uh, you'll be able to use it, in fact, to create your own weave maps if you're a conservator. Project one. Okay? So that's great. This one's really taking off, and it's turning into trying to match early Chinese silk paintings from the 12th century. That's the beginning of painting. Those things were painted on one bolt of silk for the emperor, cut pieces out, 
painted on them, and then put them in an album. The problem is these albums have since been cut apart. There's only one that's known to still be bound together. What that means is, at the very beginning of painting, there's no way for them to order all these paintings in the first two centuries. Uh, maybe this thread counting will help, or this weave matching. The, prob the reason it hasn't been done so far is the Chinese silk has, say, 75 to 150 threads per centimeter. So there's nobody that wants to count those, okay? But the computer, the computer's happy with that. Now my mission all along has been to try and convince engineers that there are real good, hard, interesting, fascinating problems here that the community, that's the art historians and the conservators and curators, care about. So I felt like I needed to do rather than just old masters. So there's a break in conservation and art history around 1900 when things change about what you do with conservation and also the ideas of art and stuff. And so the next project that I accidentally fell into, which is where I met Paul, was photo paper classification. And there, and as with each of these problems, again, I'm going to look at the problem and try to imagine that there's a solution for which there's thousands of algorithms. So for instance, everybody, I mean, you know, airport security is a big thing, right? So how do they find the bad guys? They scan the, the you know, the lobby looking for certain faces, and basically what they're doing is a texture classification or some sort of image processing algorithm. So there's lots of algorithms to try and look at the texture and compare them. And what we're going to do is try to find things that have the same topography, because the surface of photo paper, its, its shape was manufactured and made to suit the artist. So artists chose the paper because of the surface. And anything I say wrong, well, Paul will correct in his talk. Okay. So we're looking at the topography, we're trying to hunt mates there, and it turned out that we got five, five teams to start. Anyway, uh, from all over the world, so the, well, four, mo it's just three now. <laughs> so, but, but anyway, if we did silver gelatin paper, so early photography, and then it also applied to inkjet paper, and the cool thing is it looks like it's gonna apply to wove paper, and I'm assuming only the conservators know what wove paper is. Wove paper was made after 1750, it was manufactured, and there's no way right now that you can distinguish which one is which by eye, okay? And the, but the computer can do this because it can look at many levels of magnification at once instead of just one at a time. So again, we started with a simple problem, or it seems simple now, and showed that with just, the big thing here was what kind of image would you need but we used that, and I'll talk about that in a second, but we were able to solve that problem, but it, then it led to something that actually will be even more innovative. And that's what we're looking for in each of these projects. So the, the, uh, the thing we came up with, and this is where Paul and I actually worked closely together, was to use a raking light. Uh, that simple, it's just that simple. That's the only image you need. There's enough, you can tell the difference between these two, right? Again, this is where you're supposed to go. Yes, thank you. Okay, and so the idea is can you teach the, can the computer see the difference? And the answer is yes. In fact, there's lots of different texture algorithms that can find the similarity. And but what we wanted to do was show that this, this type of image, with, only with raking light, which can be repeated and done simply, doesn't require radiography or some special equipment that museums, uh, smaller museums might not have, but allows you to find paper by the manufacturer, brand, all of these, and categorize them into these small bins. Was, we were pretty surprised. I mean, we hoped and thought it would work, but it was quite a surprise to us. The cool thing is, is it's done with a portable, very low, kind of expense of sort of device. Here it is being used at Houston MFA. Yep. And uh, this is a thing that Paul made and he'll tell you a bit more about it. And, uh, but that was the surprise. First we had to figure out what image could be used to, to identify everything and then we can go further with that. And the further, as I mentioned before, was to go to wove paper. Number two, right? Okay, so at this point, I gave a talk in New York uh, at the Conservation Center about thread counting, and Peggy Ellis, whom some of you I assume know, is the uh, professor for her paper 
uh, conservation at the NYU Conservation Center. And she also, at the, at the time we did this, was the head of the conservation lab at Morgan, the Morgan Library. And she heard my talk and she said, wow, isn't thread counting something like measuring the distances between chain lines? You don't know what that means yet because you know what a chain line is. I'll show you in a second. But she's partly right, but not totally. But it was enough to get us going, and we've had a really great interaction. And it turned out I knew there was actually a student in the Netherlands who had done this for his PhD thesis. And it wasn't conclusive, but it was, uh, we were trying to simplify it. So the idea was, again, see, here's a print. So I get at least to show you some nice looking art, right? This is a nice Rembrandt print. And here's the image around the watermark. And see these lines here? So this is, this is handmade paper. How many people have made paper by hand? One, two, three, four, five, six. That's not bad. OK. So you know that you have this wooden frame with a screen inside of it. You dip it into what I think of as a big vat of spitball stuff. OK, it's pulp. OK, and then you scoop it out. And this has been done for hundreds or centuries, I guess. The Chinese, the Asians did it first, China and Japan. and then it came to Europe and then they were able to make wire. So you now have a wire screen and this, and this screen has, you can't really see it, but there's wires going across this way that are very close together. And then these chain lines, the ones that are vertical, uh, the, all the wires going across are called laid lines, are attached to that, those chain lines. So that it holds it in place. And then when you lift it up, all the water drains out, the pulp is left on the screen and you let it dry there's more to the manufacturing process, but you let it dry, you have a sheet of paper. And uh, a team of people could make thousands of sheets in one day, it turns out. So what they noticed, or what people have noticed, and in each of these cases, I'm looking to something where already in the, in the conservation literature, they know, uh, they have a technique, and the, they project for the suggestion, which came from the bibliographic literature, so people trying to look at handwritten manuscript papers, is that these spacings, are not always the same space. And you can see that by looking at the scale up at the top. They're all about an inch. Imagine that. Why an inch? I have no idea. OK, but they're not all exactly an inch. So if you have a sequence of numbers, 0.9, 1.1 inches and such, that sequence can become, if you will, an identifier. So that's what we were after. And uh, again, uh, let's see. Did I tell you? Yeah. So we use peak finding. So in other words, you have something where that white part is the top, and then the gray is a low number. So you're looking for these peaks that come about every inch. And then something, don't worry about it, called a modified Procrustean algorithm, which is how to, how to match uh, groups of lines to be considered similar. So we did that. Here's four that match. So we ultimately were able, we got a, a group of uh, over 700 images from the Dutch University Institute for Art History in Florence. And uh, they were able, we were able to look through these. And here's a group of four, all of which match. How do we know they match? Well, let's line them up with each other. And uh, you can see each of them, by the way, let me back up. There's a partial watermark here, also at the bottom of that one. You can barely see the two, the tops of the cap here. And then here, this is the whole watermark. And it's what's called a fool's cap. You can't quite see it. The image is pretty dark. But it has a, a cap with these bells on the top. So I'm, I'm going to line them all up. And you can see that the chain lines, If I, these were the four in order. And here's the, here's the ones here. And here's the ones for the next one. And if you match up these chain lines, all the others match. So here you can get a visual sense. But you wouldn't want to go through the hundreds of them to find these four. So the computer does that for you. And now that they all match, they're all considered, well, we're going to call them mold mates, because they're made on the same paper mold. And the idea is that these, that Rembrandt bought a sack, that's a bunch of paper that was made in one place and used it up. And then when it was used up, he went and bought more. And that would be a different group that was made at a different place and would have a slightly different uh, chain line pattern. So we're able, our other people have already done this. Hinterding, Eric Hinterding at the Rijks Museum is the current uh, world expert on this. The idea being is that all those that are from the same mold were made at about the same time. This then allows you to date as 
prints, which is very difficult because he reprinted prints years after he actually made the plate. So the date that's scratched in the plate does not represent the date that the impression was made. And when the impression was made, if the later it's made, typically the crappier the print because the plate starts to wear out. So collectors want the early ones. So how do we verify that they're the same? This chain line stuff isn't enough, but the point is you can see they all have basically the same feature in the watermark. And watermarks is how they identified them. And I'm thinking, okay, how many watermarks are there in Rembrandt's prints? This is a rhetorical question or an exam? There's over 500. Okay, so I've got 500 different watermarks and 700 images. And I'm thinking, I've got to look through all these to tell if the students are doing it right. No, oh, this is a great problem for the students. So, but even I'm not willing to ask them to look through 700 and 500 choices. So I said, I might, we've got to figure out some way to identify the watermarks. So that led to the next project. So in order to verify what we wanted to do here, we had to identify the watermarks. So here we use the simple idea of a decision tree. And so I'm going to just give you an example of that. So this is the bigger thing. I'll tell you what the other stuff is in a minute. But this was started in 2015 with Eric Hinterding at the Rikes Museum and a colleague of mine at the Johnson Museum at Cornell. So remember this picture? So our task is to develop an algorithm that identifies the watermarks. So what, which particular watermark is that? Well, here's a list of questions. Are there four or five points at the bottom? Are the three things, let's see here. These are called roundels, these are called balls, and the top ones are called bills. Just because they're all circles, you've got to figure out which ones go where. Uh, the terminology, so you answer these questions. Question one, that took a second. How about it, is those stacked like a pyramid or upside down? Everybody says a pyramid. Now we're to question seven, and we ask questions about whether the chain line here touches the bell at the front. Well, it does, it goes right through it. Whether the chain line here touches the bell at the back. No, it doesn't. So you just answer all these questions, and in less than three minutes, when normally it would take you three hours to look through all of these for just one case, you can tell which one it is. Every time we show this to conservators, paper conservators, they say, can I have this now? OK, people that are interested in identifying Rembrandt's prints, because there isn't really anything like that. Eric's book has the 500 images, and you can just look through and find the one you want. They're organized, but it's not easy. That's the decision tree. OK, this is just for the, this one watermark, because there's 51 or so variants of this watermark. Little bitty changes. Why are there so many that are similar? Well, you make a piece of paper that's really good with your watermark, and other people just make one with the watermark that's very similar and sell it like it's your paper at a high price. So this, there was a lot of these that are very, very similar. But they're all yes, no questions. And they're all scale invariant in the sense that it doesn't matter what size or how bad the quality of the image is. It's is the nose of the character to the left or the right of the chain line and things like that, if you notice. Here's a case where we're now looking at twins, where they're very similar. But you can see here the two bells here are level, and those two aren't. So these are slightly different. Water. What are twins? Well, actually, in the process of making paper, you have two sets of screens. So I'm dipping my screen into the spitball vat while you're rolling the print off the last one I made. Then when I get done with this one that's full of pulp, I hand it to you. You give me the one that you've just emptied, and I do that one. And the two screens are made with watermarks that are meant to be identical, which they're not, OK? Because they're made by a person that's bending the wires. Remember, this is the 17th century as well. And so they're not quite identical. But it's interesting. They're really sometimes very hard to see the difference. But actually being able to locate the chain lines. So I've marked them here in these brilliant colors. So you can see that even though these might match, that by the time you get to the next chain line, there's a difference. So you could use the chain lines, actually, to distinguish between the twins, which are otherwise harder, hard to distinguish. And you can also use the chain lines to deal with fragments. There's actually going to be an exhibition at the Johnson Museum at Cornell this fall about this project. So. That's what I've done in the last 10 years. And where, where Paul comes in is he says, oh, remember the portable box we had over here? You should be able to do that for watermarks as well. Furthermore, what about watermarks and drawings? We now discovered, we've recently discovered that they're watermarks. So in other words, his pupils use some of the same papers for their drawings that he used for his prints. 
which will also help us with dating. So I hope I've given you the impression that computation can help in giving you extra information about art questions, whether they're conservation or art history questions. And so what Paul's going to tell you is a bit more about why that's the case, at least in the paper. Paul, your turn. Great. <laughs> that was great. Never follow Rick on a talk. I can note to self. Um, yeah, let me get going here. Yeah, in case you couldn't figure it out, I wore a suit, so you could tell who the humanities guy was on the team. Science, well, never mind. Okay. Okay, now we're rolling. Um, so let's see. Um, I too wanted to, to uh, um, thank the Smithsonian for allowing me this honor and privilege to uh, to talk to you today. And just as Rick said, you know, Rick is he's he is the scientist on the team, and I'm sort of the applications guy. I'm taking what Rick is doing and trying to put it to work for problems that matter to me, and that's what we're going to talk about. And so I want to show you something. This is a sample book from around 1935, made in Belgium by the Gewerk Company. And if you ever thought that you know black and white photography is this monolith, well, this will you know this this um, will will put the lie to that. Um, why in the world would a company um, make around 40 black and white papers in a given year? Um, well, there are all kinds of variants you know, built into here. There are all kinds of variations that are important to end users, photographers, and those variations and how photographers navigate this universe tells us information about what they were trying to, what they were trying to achieve, their artistic intent, their expressive intent. So in here are, you know, conceivably this is sort of a microcosm of my, my universe, are all the variables that I want to start to measure to try to get at artistic intent, authenticity, and some of the other issues that Rick was, was talking about. And for me, I got into this around in 1999. And this was not some hypothetical problem for me. <laughs> this was a very practical, pointed, nasty problem for me. Um, I, uh, on behalf of a couple of clients, I was looking at a number of prints by the photographer Lewis Hine, and um, we saw that there was a problem, that there, were, there was fraud um, in the market. Um, there were prints that were being sold for tens of thousands of dollars that were inauthentic. Um, and, you know, when the FBI gets involved, it was not like, well, you know, I, I, didn't, I was not comfortable saying, well, this is my opinion. Um, I needed to come with fact. I, need, I really felt like I needed to build some sort of an, an empirical case, some empirical basis for my opinion. So I got to work. Oh, here's one of the fake Lewis Hines. It's a beautiful print, actually. It's a copy, a, a contact print from the original 4x5 negative. Um, and you know, of course, you know this work, right? It's iconic American photography. Um, another fraudulent hind print. And what makes a photograph a fraud um, simply, I mean, it's a reprographic medium and, you know, these are original hind negatives. What makes it a fraud is the way it's put into the marketplace. So you see the signature hind there, that's a fake signature. That probably is a solid um, Lewis Hind studio stamp, but um, it, was, it was used much later. Um, so I got to work. I got to work thinking about, you know, um, Really, what a, what's, a, what's a fraud in an artist's work? If you break it down almost as a, as a statistical question, it would be an outlier. There would be something about that fraudulent work that didn't fit an established pattern um, within the artist's uh, lifetime. And so I started to create sort of this, re this reference collection of photographic papers to be this database, to be the forensic record of 20th century photography that I could mine um, to pull out these different variables that would let us identify clusters, similarities, but also these outliers. So, 
you know, thank God for eBay. <laughs> um, this became, this was an obsession of mine. And the collection is now about 6,000 or so papers. It's all cataloged. Um, it came with me to Yale. And so therefore, I can make this accessible to researchers around the world. Um, and so this is the genome um, of 20th century black and white photographic printing. It's, you know, the idea here is that all of the major variations in manufacturing technique, um, um, uh, appearance, all of that is in some way represented here. We just need to figure out ways to interrogate this genome to get at the questions that we want answered. One of the ways to do it is paper fiber. You know, you just pull out the paper fibers, um, and this is one of the things that we did for Lewis Hahn. We pulled out the paper fibers. We can identify these paper fibers, what they are, um, and it gives, you know, you get a plot that looks like this, and you get clusters. So we were seeing, um, with the Lewis Hahn material, you know, we were seeing these green um, uh, fibers, and we were seeing concentrations at around, you know, 80 percent. And so you only see, you know, these concentrations at 80% around 1980 from, you know, let's just say 1970 to 1990 to be generous. Well, Lewis Hine dies in 1940. So those papers, I mean, they, they, you couldn't have used papers with the green fibers in 1940 according to the genome. Just wasn't, wasn't possible. They weren't available. Um, but the, those fibers, they change from year to year, decade to decade. So we went to the George Eastman house and we said, Get, give us all your Lewis Hine powerhouse mechanic prints. And none of them were dated. Some, maybe some were dated. Um, but the dates were rough, um, the ranges, but a lot of them weren't. And this is just a fraction of what we, what we were looking at. And so we took a tiny microscopic piece of, you know, a section of paper, um, had a forensic um, microscopist identify the fibers, and we were able to basically, from that, just make these clusters. And what we found out was that at the Eastman House, one of the world's great photography museums, <coughs> they only had one print that was plausibly made in 1920, which was around the date of the negative. And that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, this, when Lewis Hine was making this print, he probably had no sense that it would become this iconic image, right? I mean, there were years of publications afterward that really promoted this image. Why would he make 15, 20 prints in 1920? There's no market for them. So it's getting at from, you know, this reprographic medium, it's getting at these singularities. And so from this group, we can see that there's a special print. There's one special print that's plausibly from the 1920s, and then there's a lot of material from around the time he dies, and then slightly after he dies, and then some, the fraudulent group comes in from the, um, from the 1980s. And so if you want to know what does the Lewis Hine print look like from 1920, the date of the negative, this is one of the tools that you can use to get at that kind of information. And this is that 1920s print. 19, yeah, 1920s print. Which is beautiful. So those are some of the sort of microscopic variables. Um, but what about variables that we can see? What about variables that an artist, a photographer, would be aware of? and would, would influence his or her selection process. And so I was you know, asking myself this question, and the answer was literally staring me in the face, because on every package of paper, there's basically the four variables that, the, that an artist, that a photographer, would use to make the selection of paper. So it's the base color, and in this case, it's ivory white. And then there's texture and gloss. And texture and gloss is combined in that word percal, I don't know if you know what percal is, but it's a type of um, uh, fabric. And it's very tightly woven um, and has a little bit of a sheen to it. So it's got a little texture. This implies this paper will have a little texture, a little grain, and a, and a moderate sheen. And then the other variable, the fourth, is how thick is it? Is it does it have a really substantial physical presence? Um, is it double weight? Or is it sort of you know, more utilitarian, flimsy? Is it single weight? So those are the four dimensions of photographic paper. So like, well, I can measure those, sort of. 
<laughs> and so we put that, we sort of put this idea to work at a project that was, um, let's see, what year was that? I guess it ended in 2016 at the Museum of Modern Art, and they wanted to characterize some of their modernist photographs to make a baseline for themselves, but also to share with other collecting institutions. So I went to work making a bunch of measurements. And it's really easy to measure thickness. I mean, you can, it's just a micrometer, simple. Gloss, there's, a, um, there's something called a gloss meter, a very simple tool. Um, we can measure gloss quite easily. Color, there's all kinds of different ways to measure color in different dimensions. Here, I'm just taking sort of a yellow, uh, a blue-yellow um, measurement on this, on this one particular axis in this color system. So we can measure color. Texture, <laughs> this is where Rick comes in. Um, this was a problem. We didn't know how to measure texture. And we certainly didn't know how to measure it on a scale and the number of prints that would be useful in a collection. You know, we needed hundreds of measurements and we needed to do them rapidly. So, um, we started this challenge. And, you know, you would think, um, uh, you know, this, this might not be such a difficult problem, but this, this is what these texture photographs look like with the raking light. This is what the texture of photographic paper looks like. And there are two images on the screen here. This is the interactive part of the talk. Um, there are two images on the screen from the same piece of paper, same piece of photographic paper. So you have to know which ones they are. You have to, do you have it? Do you, ha are you, have you made your decision yet? Four and eight? Okay, I heard a four and eight. Nice. You know, I think that's the first time anybody's gotten this. All right, all right, okay. All right. <laughs> and I can keep going. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, okay, so one more. Come on, somebody else this time. You ready? Okay, here we go. Hey, so who got 14 and 16? Who, who got that one? Nice. That's really good. Yeah, really, you're hired. And so, <laughs> so this, this is, you know, humans can do this, but it's hard work. And this is only, this is only a set of nine. But what if you have 9,000? What if you have a data set, just like what Rick was saying, as soon as you scale up the problem, you need a machine, you need a computer, you need algorithms. Um, but before you get there, you need computer scientists to help you out. And that's um, where, we, where we started. And this is the, oh, I shouldn't say, this is the, you know, this was the shared slide. Um, <laughs> um, and so, you know, what, what I, when I bring to these problems, what I bring to these projects is um, I'm willing to do the work to make the data. Because you can't do the science that Rick is doing, the, the, you know, the signal processing without any signal. And so I invented this little um, device, which is just a bunch of parts put together, um, you know, off-the-shelf parts. And it's very repeatable, it's very rapid, it's non-contact, it's something that we can, we can build and disperse to different collections. And we just took that leap of faith that these two-dimensional raking light images from textures were going to be the, an adequate basis to make an algorithm. And one of the ways that we did it to promote this is we put the, a training set up on the web. And, and if you go to paper texture, if you feel like you have a paper texture algorithm in you, um, you're inspired by this talk, <laughs> um, you can go to papertextureid.org, download the training set, and build a classification algorithm. Um, and this, that classification, Training set is the exact training set that we gave to the, um, the teams that Rick brought together at MoMA. And the, the, one of the techniques that I like the most is the one that I can understand the most. It makes the most sense to me just intuitively. So here's a raking light image. Um, the, the light is raking in from the top. Um, and you know, this is very common. This is what we see. And this technique, this signal processing technique, just basically is taking the lightest pixels and using the, light, the, the pixel brightness as a proxy for height. And as soon as you do that, you can start you know, mapping dimensions, three, dim th three dimensions. And once you have the map made, you can look at that map, 
by throwing you know, a, a mesh over it. And the mesh can be at different scales. You can have big openings, big apertures, and smaller apertures. And those multiple scales also give you information about your surface. It's this multi-scale method. And so now we've solved the problem. <laughs> Or have we? You know, um, 4.9 scale one pseudo area fractal scale analysis. Okay, wait a minute, because <laughs> I need to communicate this to humanities people. I need people in the humanities. I need curators, art historians, conservators to use this, to, to understand their materials based on this. And in fact, you know, 0.172 millimeters is not that useful either, frankly. So, what do you do with these numbers? That was the next problem. And so it was back to the genome. And we just made thousands of measurements of these four variables using these techniques. And so here's thickness, um, you know, a, a, a few thousand thickness measurements starting from 1900 going to 2010. And you see these clusters. Now, the, the Lursky from the MoMA if you remember, it was 0.172 millimeters. That's 0.172 millimeters. And so you can see it's right in the heart of this thinner cluster here, um, single weight paper. And you can see just sort of intuitively here, visually, you can see, yeah, about 15% of the papers are thinner and about 85% of the papers are thicker, right? So all we do is we take that Lursky data point and we make it, you know, we put it into a percentile. How many were thicker? How many were thinner? So we can take these numbers and really get rid of them. And we can visualize the results based on the percentiles from the genome. So what I'm saying here is, just like I said, in, in terms of thickness, about 80% are thicker, about 15% are thinner. Gloss, this is a very matte paper, almost 90% are, are glossier than this. So it's a very matte paper, yes, is that what I said? Color is very neutral, it's right in the middle. Texture, it's got a lot more texture, a lot more area scale fractals um, than um, most of the papers in the genome, in the reference collection. But I wasn't satisfied with this either because that still takes some interpretation and I thought I could get one more, I thought if I ar arranged these data points, um, I could get, get at so almost those four variables, I can consolidate them into one. I can make this glyph, basically, and this glyph is the thumbprint now for the expressive dimensions of the photographic paper. So it's, now it's from all those different variables, we've distilled it down to this really simple glyph visualization for the texture, the thickness, the gloss, and the base color. And so you can start doing useful things with this. It's all numeric, it's all, you know, there's all the numbers in the background. So we can do, we can compare the numbers. And so we looked at, um, on the left column, there are four columns here, the left and the left over here, those are prints from the MoMA's collection. And on the right, those are prints from the MFA Houston collection. So they're very compatible, you know, these sister prints. And these prints were never in the same room together, but the equipment went to them, and we pulled out measurements from those, from those pairs. And you get things like this. This is the Lursky from the MoMA that we were just talking about. This is the Lursky from the MFA Houston, and here's the glyph for that. So we see instantly that it's probably, it's the same gloss and the same base color, more or less, but the texture is much different. It's a much smoother paper, and this one is a very thick paper. So maybe this one was made for exhibition, you know, a, a heavier paper um, would stand up better for exhibition. Um, who knows? Who knows? Um, but they don't share, they're the same image, but they don't really share a material history necessarily. Same with this, very different conception, the way it's composed, also very different papers. But this is also a different conception, but identical papers. And so now we can, you know, we have a system, the beginnings of a system to build out and populate these databases and compare not just images across collections, but compare the material basis for those images across collections. Um, we put that to work recently for um, 
a Moholy-Nagy exhibition that the Guggenheim put together, went to the Art Institute of Chicago, which is from the website here. I love that self-portrait of Moholy, um, which is why I used it. But then it just closed at, um, at LACMA um, a couple months ago, about a month ago. Moholy has, throughout his entire career, made these photograms. And a photogram is a cameraless print. No camera is involved. Um, uh, and it's really the document of a performance. So he's changing the light, he's changing objects, he's putting down objects, he's setting them in place, turning on the light, he'll make some changes, do another exposure, and then he'll just, he'll just develop it. He made these for roughly 40 or so years. And he moved around, there were different periods, and so we had about, our data set, we had about 300, four, 350 or so Moholy photograms. And so now that they're all literate in glyphs, you know, you don't, you can look at the images and you can start to see similarities, but now you can start to look at, you know, these glyphs and start to see patterns forming in these glyphs. And again, since they're all numerically based, we can start deriving out clusters in an automated way. Um, and that's really the next step, is to, you know, take those, take that data, make it available to scholars, and really serve it to them in a way that surfaces these clusters. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to talk about just really briefly, it's almost a digression here, but bear with me. There, there is a Moholy um, catalog raisonné for, uh, for these photograms. And the person who prepared the catalog raisonné did this really heroic job of trying to capture some sort of materiality. And one of the things that she looked at was one of the things that I looked at was gloss. And so she had these four categories. No, I can't count. Five. High gloss, glossy, semi-gloss, semi-matte, and matte. But when we measured <laughs> the gloss, you can see there's just massive overlap across these, across these categories. And so, you know, what I'm, not, what I'm trying to do is not replace sort of visual connoisseurship or sub you know, subjectivity, I'm trying to make it better. And I'm, when I would have said to her, had I been in, in a situation to advise her, buy a gloss meter, it's $4,000, and it will fit in your briefcase, and you don't have to have these subjective categories that, in the end, are not that meaningful. We can, you know, let, let the machines do what machines are really good at, so you can do, and you can focus on what you're really good at, is the interpretation piece. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of this idea of artistic intent. And how do you get artistic intent out of, uh, out of all of these numbers? <clears throat> so I did a little project on this sample book where we looked at two things on the opposite end of the, of the Gewehrt's um, marketing line at, in 1935. So Gewehrt had this paper called Largex up here, and it's very glossy, it's very smooth, and it's very, it's like a, the, probably the cheapest paper that they made. And they made it for photo finishing, um, commercial photo finishing. So a lot of snapshots, ten, millions of photographs were made on that paper. On the opposite end, this, this was probably the most expensive photographic, at least black and white photographic paper ever produced. This is um, Givalux Velour. Um, it's incredibly matte surface. It's um, this rough surface. It's thick. It's incredibly thick. It's this, you know, it's, um, um, and it was also the, um, they called it the most beautiful paper ever made, <laughs> which is a, a sort of a huge boast. And if you look at the glyphs, now again, you're glyph literate. So over here is large X. And so, you know, this is like a, a, a a visual for photo finishing, one after another. You know, the, the, the rapid photo finishing paper. Um, you know, it, the faster they come, the better you'll like it. In other words, the more money you're going to make off of this paper. Well, here's the glyph for this in the center. You know, it doesn't, it's, 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 it's small, it's, it's smooth, it's glossy. It's, it's got a, almost a um, bluish tonality, or seri you know, very white um, tone, and it's very thin. And this, you know, the most beautiful paper ever made. I wasn't kidding. Um, and look what it does in terms of the, the genome. It's just, it's right pushing 
the farthest extremes on all four of these expressive dimensions. And what, so what does this mean? I mean, they have some sort of clues here. This is kind of utilitarian, and to make a record, and this is to make art. You know, your best pictorialist prints will look their best on this paper, the most beautiful paper. You know, and it's talking about prize winning and exhibitions. I don't know if you can read all of that. So again, now that you're sort of literate in these materials, you can start putting some words against this and start bringing out meaning. And so over here, you're talking about information. It's real. It's utilitarian. It's truth. And over here, it's interpretive. It's subjective. It's imagined. It's crafted. It's all about art. It's about the past. It's about eternity. You know, again, these papers, the rough texture, what they'll do is they'll break up detail. So if you're making an, a portrait, you know, with this paper, every single flaw on, the, on your subject is going to be recorded. But if you print it on this paper with this expanded, blown out <coughs> texture, all of that gets um, paved over, so to speak. It gets generalized. And so, again, truthiness, fiction, pictorial, you know, very present, a record, it's immediate, the past. And, you know, this is the last pair of slides. Um, <laughs> kind of applying these techniques to some of the um, platinum prints made by Robert Maplethorpe in the last decade of his life. This is a, um, a project that I'm doing with the, uh, the Guggenheim Museum that has a tremendous collection of Maplethorpe's materials. So this print was, um, well, let me show you the clusters first. And here's that print. So this is, these are the clusters. This is a cluster diagram. I'm not going to get into that. Um, but it's from the, the surface textures. There are two major groups of these platinum prints made by Maplethorpe. And that's the, really the point of this slide. One big cluster here, one big cluster here. And where it breaks, where the clusters break, is 1985-86. And if you know anything about Maplethorpe, you know that this is when he was diagnosed with AIDS. This is when he effectively got a death sentence. And he changed his printers, and he changed his approach. So one of the things that, you know, and this is one of the reasons I showed that slide for Moholy, is, you know, I, th and I'm very sensitive to this, like, you know, that my work is really um, reductionist. It's taking art and it's making it into data. It's turning it into numbers. And you know, like neo-formalist, if, if you're an art historian, you know what that means. And I take, a, I take offense to that, because what I'm trying to do is surface these kind of distinctions, right? And make those distinctions accessible and distinctions that you can share across collections. So I don't have to say, you know, look for the, it's got a little more texture, more texture than what? I, no, I can send you this database, and this baseline can be compared. You can use it in your collection. And you can get at things like he's using this broader, more open texture for his later prints. And you can start thinking about what does that mean if you've just received a death sentence. Um, he is, <laughs> he, I can't even chart his papers in terms of the glyph, because they go outside my glyph, it's a, he's like a, it's a whole other universe. He, he breaks my glyph. <laughs> and, he's what, but, and what he's doing is he's actually going, you know, in these later prints, he's actually going beyond photography, beyond what was done in photography in terms of photographing printing. If you talk to Sal Lopes, who made these prints in Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts, he said Maplethorpe was so adamant, he picked this paper from this particular mill with this particular texture, and he insisted that Sal work with it, and Sal told him, I, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can clear it. The, you know, I don't know if I can process it properly because it's so thick. It's got so much texture. It just is, you know, I, I don't think they're going to hold up. I don't think they're going to last. But fortunately, they do last. Um, and so he's going outside of 
um, what was known, what was done typically with photography. He's going past Stieglitz, let's say, um, and he's, he's really, um, he's, he's making, he's using paper that, he's making prints that more like Durer than like Stieglitz. And I don't have to just stand up here and tell you that as my opinion. I can demonstrate that with data. And I don't think that's reductionist at all. I think that gives art historians a new tool um, and it enhances their acuity. Um, and so that's all I have to say. And I think we have time for some questions. Great job. Oh, that's terrific. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I'm thirsty. I hope there are some questions. Uh, uh, microphone. Yes, <laughs> but it not, not go across the, uh, the internet is the thing. Sure, outliers for sure. Isn't there like one negative that is the original? And, and if so, how can somebody make a false print if they don't have the original negative? Can you distinguish that through your work? Um, you know, I mean, what we're finding out, I think, is that, you know, especially in the pictorialist period, you know, so like, you know, let's just say, let's just call it 1890 to the 1930 or so. Um, there was so much work done on negatives and so many um, stages of a negative's life that, you know, there, sometimes in some instances, yeah, there is a camera original and it never deviates. But in some cases, that camera original is worked on throughout. And so th that becomes a problem. You know, I, I've never seen it, but I would imagine it's not impossible to take a high resolution image file and make a plausible looking negative. It, uh, so we have a, uh, an expert. Okay, so some, <laughs> my colleague uh, Adrian Lundgren from the Library of Congress has actually done what now? Okay, so she, she took a photograph, so she made a copy, yeah. negative, and made a very plausible print from that negative? Yeah, so I looked at F. Hollandaise, and then I photographed F. Hollandaise in our collection, and I made a digital negative, and then I reprinted it in the same process. And I can tell the difference, because I know it's worked so well, but normal, everyday people would not. Yeah, and given the range of other possible variables, you would think of those variables first as more plausible than, you know, oh, somebody made a digital copy name. So, so I would say to that, too, there are a lot of artists that print from the same negatives within their lifetime, but much later, mm -hmm. right? So that's also a factor in the, um, the negative isn't always just used at the time, right? Do you want to talk about that? So let me chime in about prints. So Rembrandt's prints, they're plates that are still available from his prints. They're print plates that are still available now. The problem is, is that the ones done during his lifetime, he was one of the rare artists who actually did his own printing. And so the way he wiped off the ink uh, and all these different things, uh, collectors want ones that were made during his lifetime. Uh, the problem is, is the plates wear. So the fine details, you make too many prints, they're gone. So connoisseurs can actually look at these and try and tell the difference. But he actually went back and did separate editions, so to speak, by redoing some of the lines or changing something. And in fact, he would go and change small objects so people would have to have both versions in selling them. So there's a, there's a desire to have the early prints rather than the ones that were done after his lifetime. And many connoisseurs can actually look at them and tell the difference. So there's, it's from, from my perspective, it's a commercial desire. Hmm. So, uh, but you can, if you look at the prints, you can tell they're crisper. The darks are darker and so on and so forth. So there is a desire to find the ones that were of a certain period. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, two questions. The first is for both of you. Uh, I'm raking light. Uh, does the angle or the intensity of the light matter to the computer, or does that have to be kind of standardized when you're doing the raking light to begin with? 
It, it certainly helps to standardize. Yeah. So we're very careful with our angle, um, and we're very careful with, we're relatively careful with intensity um, of light, but we're trying to get a good histogram, okay. so we don't want any clipping. So we don't want any dead pixels. We don't want a, a lot of black and a lot of white because there's no information in black, nor is there any information in white. So we want this sort of attenuated grayscale. We're looking for this, you know. Our, the, the, the computer can kind of take that into account. And so if you, if you make them properly following some basic rules, yeah, one of the, every one of the algorithms, every one of the successful algorithms does a pre-processing step where it will throw away, essentially, um, those kind of variables and, and okay. sort of make one look to an eye, you know, a human look exactly like another um, in terms of exposure and things like that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Second angle question. turns out to be the most critical. I'm sorry? The angle turns out to be the most critical because that'll change the height or the perceived yeah. depth. So there is a skew and we're actually working on, you know, some sort of limitations. How much can you skew a sample and have the computer say it's still the same sample. And mm -hmm. actually we're getting some really preliminary, for sure, but we're getting some really good results saying there's actually a lot of latitude when it comes to skew. Mm -hmm. Good. Second question is just for Rick. You, you sort of touched on this. There are a number of paintings of questionable Vermeer attribution. Yes. And you, you mentioned one of them having better evidence now. Have, have, has that the kind of thing shown up in some of the other questionable or probable, improbable attributions? Uh, not so much with Vermeer. Um, the, most of the ones we've looked at that were, we call them former Vermeers, so they were <laughs> considered Vermeers at some point and then connoisseurship people decided they weren't. And we haven't found any of those yet where the uh, weave matches some of the ones that are established, except for the one I showed you. Um, but this is, if you go to Van Gogh, it's kind of a different game. Uh, there we've actually, well, I was, I, I passed that project off to other colleagues, but we used to get like four or five inquiries a year from the Van Gogh Museum that we weren't allowed to tell anybody about. And usually one of those about each year would turn out to have been a match and six months later we get a message today the museum is <laughs> going to announce that so and so is an actual Van Gogh but we're not allowed to talk about it, so to speak, because uh, owners of paintings don't like to have this kind of information made public unless it is a true Van Gogh. Mm -hmm. But the Van Gogh Museum gets about uh, a request on average every day to look at paintings that people think are Van Goghs. And very, 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 very few of them are. Uh, the thing that I find astounding is that a very large fraction of them they've already seen so they come to the museum, the museum hmm. says it's not a Van Gogh, they disappear back into the art right. market, right. somebody else buys them and comes back to the museum. And the museum has a policy of just saying, I'm sorry, we've looked at it already, it's not a Van Gogh. Does, does the museum have this capacity to do this on their own or they, do they call you in to do this? Uh, they called us in to do the weave matching. There's a number of other things they look at as well. But yes, we're trying to make the software, so we've openly published the software, we've openly published the technique, and I'd say there's now probably a dozen or so different places who have written their own software to do these things. Uh, at some point it will just become another standard thing that the museums do. Mm -hmm. But you need these x-rays that cover the full painting. So when I first started working with the Rijks Museum, they have, I don't know, several thousand paintings, but they only had 140 of them that were x-rayed for the full painting, because often they were just looking at certain parts of the painting. So the big problem, again, it's like Paul says, is accumulating the data. So and, and x-raying all the paintings in the world is an expensive process. <laughs> but uh, in, once you've done the x-rays, we want infrareds, uh, we want XRF, we mm -hmm. want, I don't know, you know, blah, blah, blah. So the problem is, is the data is not quite there. When I started 10 years ago, nothing was digitized. The, they had right. analog x-rays, and uh, that's still gonna stay that way for a while. But it's the data that's the problem. How, how are these uh, Smithsonian and National Gallery here in Washington doing on that score? Uh, I have some interaction with the National Gallery. Uh, there are the major museums like the National Gallery and, and uh, Met and the Rijksmuseum and such, the National Gallery in London, 
are very aggressive. They're, try they're beginning to put all of their materials online, scientific materials, so that other museums can use them. But f until about five years ago, everybody held their data to themselves because if there was something to be found, they wanted to find it themselves type of thing. Stuff like that. So, but that's changed dramatically in the last decade. Thank you. wanted to follow up with, because I was thinking about, that sounds weird, like I would make a copy of a negative or whatever, but I wanted to follow up to say I'm studying this artist, so I made a, a print, a fake print, so I knew it would be an outlier in my database. So it's like what Paul was saying, you gather all of this data on someone, and then you plot these outliers. So I wanted something that would definitely be an outlier, but I would say this is the value of this type of work, is that with photography, then you can really look at someone, a, ph a photographer, and say this paper is a real outlier. It doesn't mean necessarily that it's not by them, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it makes you look at that thing more closely. And so, yes, people can make fake negatives and fake prints from these mm -hmm. things, but as we study photographic artists more, then we can start to say, okay, these are all outliers now. And I think that's really the value, I think, for mm -hmm. me. So I'll, I'll throw one more thing into the mix here. Think of 3D printing. So I predict that in a few years you'll be able to buy a replica of your favorite painting that will give you the museum experience. In other words, once we figure out how to put the antique <laughs> pigments through the nozzle of the 3D printer, we'll be able to make something that has exactly the same texture and gloss and such until you actually test it scientifically. So the problem with flat prints, if you have a painting and make a copy, is that when you move it doesn't change and you don't get the museum experience. But if I could put that small texture in there and have exactly the right paint gloss and such, then you'll be able to have the experience as you move with the painting. It'll be like being in the museum and I'm sure you'd be happy to pay high price for the, your favorite painting in the world. I'm not talking about 50 million, I'm talking about 500 to 1,000 dollars and museums recognize this. So we're gonna go back to the point where they're gonna be very protective of, you, of giving out 3D information about mm -hmm. their prints. But this doesn't mean that you can't tell the difference. You, you go up and scratch it or something and it'll immediately reveal itself as a fake. But uh, I really feel like that's the other thing that's going to happen with this technology is you, as, as we study these things, we'll be able to actually reproduce things in a more uh, realistic or museum experience sort of way. And that's going to actually change the ability for the millions and millions of people that can't make it to fine institutions like this. So I see this actually is not encouraging forgers, which is what some people worry about, but rather I think it's going to open up mm -hmm. the fine art experience to people like myself. I never made it to a museum until I was in my early 20s. It just wasn't part of what, what happened around me where I grew up in the Deep South. So I, I, see, the, I see the flip side. Rather than the fear that you're yeah. going to somehow be able to create these things that fool people, I'm thinking, yes, what you want to do is fool people's sensors so that they get the experience. But anybody that actually investigates the material will be able to quickly tell that it's not an original. There was a little research group that got formed right after the Lewis Hine thing broke in the papers and the press. And you know, as part of that research group, one of the people there from a large collecting institution in uh, Los Angeles that will remain nameless, mm -hmm. up on the mountain, you know. Um, it starts with a G, right? I don't have no idea. Whoa. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, just basically made us all like, you know, he really wanted us to um, sign an oath, like almost literally, that, yeah. you know, the, the information in this room does not get out because we, not, we don't want to hand the playbook yep. to the forgers. And I think I've been opposed to that from day one. I think, um, you know, obviously I don't want to hand a playbook to forgers, but, um, but there's no way to build scholarship if you don't share information. Mm -hmm. And this is, yes, it can be used for, you know, um, bad purposes, but y y you don't get the kind of collaborations you need if you sit on this data, if you're not willing to share it, put it on the web, allow graduate students in, in Taipei, like just happened with the paper texture ID data set like mm -hmm. last week, mm -hmm. download it and start to play with it and come up with the next algorithm. Yep. Yes, in the 1980s, there was a Rembrandt study group that went around authenticating mm. yes. Rembrandts and, yes. and then a number of them were attributed to the school of or just were yes. declared. 
Um, have they come back now that you have these computational tools to try to reassess it? And then the second thing is, um, are these computational tools used to uh, authenticate correspondence like um, artistic uh, letters or hmm. artist letters hmm. or historical documents? Hmm. So I'll answer the second one first. Uh, typically those letters, it depends on when the artist lived, but there are many of them like uh, manuscripts of novels and stuff are likely to be on wove paper and at this point there's no identification method. So that's something that we see in the future. Uh, the first question is actually the Rembrandt project started in the 1968 and uh, was uh, the first major effort at what's called technical art history so that a group of Dutch scholars was going to go around and look at every painting that was attributed to Rembrandt. At that time the attribution was close to a thousand and uh, now it's under 500 and they basically used everything, connoisseurship, provenance, materials, uh, every scientific thing they could think of, and they were the first people, a fellow named Ernst von der Wettering, they were the first to emphasize the canvas study. So actually, that's where my ideas came from. Yes, I've shared this with them. No, that project is now ended. All the data is stored at the RKD, uh, and among my many affiliations, I'm a consultant or advisor for the RKD, and the idea is, yes, uh, that all of these things are being studied. One final comment, it's not, it's, it's not really changed much with Rembrandt yet, partly because Rembrandt used what we technically call crappy canvas, so it was rather cheap. The threads changed thickness and the, and the distances were not, root, not regular, and so our numerical method relies on them being fairly periodic. So we're having to develop new methods to deal with those types of canvas. And uh, so there are other colleagues that I've enticed into this area that are actually trying to develop techniques that go in and mark every thread individually. And ultimately, we'll have really high statistical data. But at this point, it hasn't changed anything in the Rembrandt database. Hmm. Does that answer your question? And there was a question here. Rick, in the, um, in, in the original thread count um, project, you obviously had sort of two phases. You had a classification phase where you were identifying a particular pattern set that you wanted to then um, use as a, as a marker. And then you had used visualization to do the, you know, essentially human visualization to then do the correlation. Mm -hmm. um, are you now using machine learning tools and neural networks to allow the computer to go to that next step to do the correlation more accurately or on a wider data set? So that's a great question, and you used exactly the right term. Correlation is exactly how we actually did the first six I showed you. The first three we found, we found algorithmically by matching the correlation. So if you have stripes, you just sum, the, you sum each of the columns, and that gives you a profile, and you match the profiles. Unfortunately, the images, as you saw, are not clear stripes. They're very noisy. And so you end up with uh, correlation coefficients that are around 0.7, which aren't very convincing. For those of you that know a little bit of math, one is very convincing. Zero is not, not related at all. And uh, the problem with this is that this is a field where you do not want to separate the expert from the object. So it's imperative on us if we're trying to get the experts to use our techniques and accommodate them into their toolkit that at this point that they be in the loop. So the visual part is usually going to ultimately be confirmation rather than the search part as I showed it here. But at this time we do feel like we've got to have a method that allows the expert to stay in the loop rather than just saying, here's the match, don't ask me how I got it. Okay, and so once, what happens is once they become familiar with when our technique works and doesn't work and what it tells them, they can use it with some sort of skill. And it's just like interpreting x-rays, which was difficult at the beginning. Yeah. So ultimately, this will be absorbed. But right now in the beginning, I think it's imperative to keep the expert in the loop. So that's why it's, I presented it that way. Yeah, it's really fundamental. I mean, we did a, a, another small experiment where we, I don't know if you've heard of Amazon's Mechanical Turk, which is a platform for looking at image similarities. And, you, and it's just to crowdsource 
um, image sorting, really hard image sorting tasks. And you know, we uploaded um, thousands of texture images and had people that we would pay, you know, two cents a, a, a match or something like that, um, to, to make pairs and make clusters for us. And we had on the back end a, um, you know, a machine learning algorithms l learning how to sort like the crowd, how to sort images like the crowd. And then we applied that data to, well, uh, uh, Adrian's um, data set from the Library of Congress, this, this F. Holland Day data set of textures. And where she says, you know, because I'm an expert, because I know Day and I've been looking at these images, I know that there are 14 papers that he's using. I'm, that's just a you know, that's not, don't, that's not literal, but I know that there are 14 clusters. And so you can tell the algorithm, look for 14 clusters, but there's those, they're not the same 14 clusters. So the algorithm is sensitive to features that the human is not. And so we're engaged now in this kind of circular dialogue between the machine learning system and the expert to kind of refine, you know, really to, to effectively model what Adrian knows and what she's, the signal that she's picking up from the work and get that algorithm to, to adapt to F. Holland Day. But then I can imagine we would want to adapt it to another artist, Cartier-Bresson, a Maplethorpe, a Man Ray. And that adaptation phase, the interaction between the machine learning algorithms and the expert observer would need to happen all over again. Same thing with the watermarks. Um, I don't want to say these two are the same, and trust me, the computer said so. What I've got to be able to do with the, art, with the expert is say, look at this feature and this feature and this feature, and you'll see that they're different or similar. In other words, you look at, so I need, that's why we have the decision tree. So I have this trail of features to look at, and if it's yes, no, yes, 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 or whatever, it's this one. Mm -hmm. And so that trail becomes the distinctions that the person can see visibly so that they can actually convince themselves that this is the right one rather than just trusting a machine. The other problem with machine learning is that you need hundreds of thousands of samples instead right. of 50 or 500. And we're now in the range of hundreds rather than hundreds of thousands. Plus, the machine learning thing is going to tell you, well, all the odd Fourier coefficients are less than seven and blah, 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 and there's no way you can see that in the image. No art historian or conservator is going to accept that. Because no artist would have used that as a yeah. visual criterion to make a selection right. for the materials. So at some point, yes. So if you look at all mm -hmm. of the watermarks produced in the 17th century in Europe, now we're talking about 150,000 or more different watermarks, then the machine learning might be useful. But the problem is, is then your data set becomes so dense, you, there's, the distinctions are almost impossible to tell. So it's, it's five o'clock, and so um, but I think we can take one more question. Is that okay? We, it looks, looks like we have one more question. Well, being a conservator, my question is, how do you find the conservation treatments affecting the data sets that you're creating? Because when I think about yeah. lining a painting or yeah. treating works of art on paper, and then how are you advising conservators in that regard to the effects of their structural treatments on things like historical data moving forward? Yeah. I, I think, you know, my, you know, for, before going to Yale, doing conservation treatment for the marketplace was how I earned a living. So I, you know, I have a lot of experience as a treatment conservator. And um, I think all of these projects have made me much more sensitive to, you know, these, these expressive dimensions that I'm talking about and trying to preserve them. Um, and not alter them. I'm looking more at an object almost as this forensic record, this tether between the present and this moment of creation. And um, I'm trying to intervene as minimally as possible so I'm not corrupting that record, that tether. I want that to be as true and as clear and as direct as it possibly can be. And so that's just in terms of the qualitative side of, the, of conservation treatment. From, from a, you know, just a real nuts and bolts quantitative side, how badly does conservation treatment screw up the data set? <laughs> it screws it up a lot. Mm -hmm. it, can really, it can really have sort of a terrible impact 
um, on these expressive dimensions. Like if you surface clean mm -hmm. a, a highly glossy photograph, you can make it very, you can make it much more matte. And now it's, you know, it, the glyph is a different glyph. What we're looking at are things that don't, what we're trying to figure out is how do we navigate things that maybe don't change, like thickness, mm -hmm. and make those anchor points when we start building up these systems that are looking for clusters. So thickness gets privileged maybe over, um, over gloss, um, which is a variable that can be not only impacted by treatment, but you know, long-term storage in high relative humidity environments and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, um, if it is a forensic record, I mean, the first rule of thumb is, you know, you don't, you don't alter it, right? You don't mess with your evidence, and that's... So with that's prints, one of the things you do, of course, with treatments with paper, it often involves wetting them in mm -hmm. one form or another. And so right. they, well, they absorb, they conceivably expand, they dry, they might not dry back to the same dimensions. And this is when we first talked talked about doing the chain lines the first time I presented it. There were several people in the audience saying, that'll never work. I mean, they got very angry <clears throat> about the idea. So we went off and ran some tests. And it appears that in many cases it has a minuscule effect and doesn't change the similarity. The, 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 the chain line pattern is pretty much preserved to the accuracy we need. And that's from taking the paper and printing on it, which is high pressure, and wetting it and drying it and so on and so forth. But I'm sure in many cases it'll make a difference. But uh, we are look, trying to look for features, I'm kind of paraphrasing what you yep. said, where the typical treatments don't change the features we're looking for. Mm -hmm. that, that's so, but that's not always the case. I mean, think of relining a canvas or restretching it if you really put tension on it. Mm -hmm. But usually it doesn't change the center, uh, the, the thread spacing in the center of the canvas. We typically don't want to look at the edges because of cusping and some of the effects mm -hmm. due to stretching. So, but there's a lot more to learn about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, these tools, in my opinion, are still very crude. It's, it's also, actually, it's interesting, too, because now people are sort of looking at, you know, they're looking at evaluating treatments relative yes. to these four dimensions. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, how, how does my treatment impact the glyph, so to speak? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, another, it's another tool to evaluate um, treatment efficacy, whatever. Okay. Thank you very, Thank very you. much. Thank you all for coming. And thanks to our speakers. <laughs>